Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm a neuroscientist, not a stem cell or developmental biologist, but I've been so excited about the breakthrough uh, that Chinya uh, has made. I think it's really potentially very powerful for our field, and so we've really been drawn into it. Uh, so I want to thank uh, ISSCR, the Roddenberry Center, and Gladstone for putting the symposium together. And Deepak, I think he used the words electric and magical uh, to describe yesterday, and I think I'd have to agree. Um, I thought the symposium was pretty good, too. Uh, <laughs> so today I'm going to talk about three things. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the enormous challenge that neurodegenerative diseases represent uh, for us as scientists and society. And I'll uh, explain a little bit about an imaging technology that we've developed uh, that I think is especially well suited to help in the process of creating patient-derived iPSC models of disease. I'll uh, show how we've used it and other approaches to try to develop iPSC-derived models of two neurodegenerative diseases, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS, and Huntington's disease. And then a little bit at the end about our efforts to apply the technology to therapeutics development. So uh, you couldn't hardly pick a harder problem or a bigger problem than neurodegenerative disease. Uh, it's an enormous problem right now, and it promises to grow in the future. Uh, at the moment, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's, and ALS are collectively the fifth leading killer in the United States, and they're going to increase uh, in the future, and that's because the number one risk factor for at least three of those four diseases is age. And this is a graph of the number of people in the United States uh, uh, that uh, are present in our population at different ages. And what I want to focus your attention on here is this swell that is the baby boomers, uh, which are now just about the age at the peak incidence of some of these diseases. And I called it a swell. Some people are calling it a tsunami uh, that's going to hit our, um, our healthcare system. And that's because these diseases are, of course, devastating to the patients who have them, they're devastating to the families because much of the caregiving is, uh, falls to the family. And then also for our healthcare system and medical care costs. Uh, I won't tell you the figures. They're too scary to say out loud. Um, and <clears throat> it's not just a US problem. It really is a worldwide problem. Uh, it turns out that some of the populations in Europe and Asia are even older on average than ours. And so they're going to face even more difficult times. For example, it's estimated that in China, by 2040, there will be more people with dementia than the rest of the developed world combined. And unfortunately, as of 2012, it's still the case that not a single disease-modifying therapy exists for any of these major neurodegenerative diseases. Now, people have really puzzled about why this is the case. Uh, and there may be a productivity problem in pharma. This is the number of FDA-approved drugs in four-year increments from 1996 to 2007 by indication. And you can see that for all these indications, infectious disease, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and neurodegeneration, the number of drugs each year, at least in this uh, interval, have declined. But I'd point out that neurodegeneration starts out at a really low level and manages to go a little lower still. So uh, this clearly is a challenging area. And although I think you could fairly make the argument that pharma hasn't invested, has not invested in this area in proportion to the societal need, it, isn't, it certainly is the case that clinical trials have been performed. I'll just mention one in the case of ALS. Uh, these are some of the drugs that have been tested in clinical trials. And uh, one thing that these drugs all have in common is that in humans they failed, for the most part. Uh, there's one drug, Riliazol which adds a few months to patients' lives with ALS, uh, but it has a lot of side effects. So a big challenge. Uh, and one of the other common features that many of these drugs have is that they all were tested in mice, or many of them were, and were shown to be effective. So I think it raises troubling uh, questions for us because at the moment, the mouse is still the arbiter of which therapies go on to be tested in humans. And I think it's a reasonable question to ask whether that's a good idea given the track record that we've seen. Uh, I think the rationale was clear. There are a lot of genetic similarities between mice and people. But I think we have to ask whether from the standpoint of a drug, uh, the mouse is really the best system. And I think you can certainly point to a number of neuroanatomic differences, uh, differences in cell types. There are cells 
Uh, I don't know if you saw Kelly Haston's poster, a postdoc in my lab yesterday, trying to make von Economo neurons. These are neurons that are affected in Alzheimer's and frontotemporal dementia, and they don't even seem to exist, as far as we can tell, in mice. Uh, but there are reasons, just thinking about how drugs work, to worry, too. Um, drugs are so small that even single amino acid changes in proteins can make a difference whether those drugs work or not. And there are at least a half dozen examples of proteins where there's a single amino acid difference between mice and humans, and it completely changes the pharmacology of the drug. So it would be nice to be able to have human models to be able to use for some of the drug development, at least to assure ourselves that whatever we're trying to develop actually could work in a human cell. Well, we've been trying to do this for the last uh, two, two and a half years or so. And I'll just sum summarize from my perspective as a neuroscientist some of the pros and cons of trying to use iPS cells to model neurodegenerative diseases. Certainly one of the pros is that I think it's an unprecedented opportunity in principle to model sporadic human neurodegenerative disease. And what I mean by that is that um, about 90% of people who get Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS get it for reasons we don't understand. In other words, there's no single genetic mutation we can identify that these people have, and so that makes it really hard to model it in the laboratory. Uh, so the prospect of being able to get a skin cell from patients with these diseases, turn it into a stem cell and then a neuron, offers us the opportunity uh, to be able to study a human neuron from a patient with that disease and maybe a path to be able to study sporadic disease that we didn't have before. Screening patient stratification for clinical trials and personalized medicines also are really other appealing applications. And I just want to say a bit about patient stratification because it, the benefits there may not be obvious. Suppose that you've worked, you've spent your billion dollars to develop a drug, and you've worked for 15 years, and you're about to test it into clinical trials. And maybe it actually works on a subset of patients with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease. Uh, the problem is you may not know which subset it works on. And so unless you know that information, it's going to be very difficult to design a clinical trial to show that it works. So for all that investment, you could actually have a drug that works but have no way to show that it does. And once it fails clinical trial, it may be very difficult to resurrect after that. So it's possible that these cells could be used to be able to test in one way or another, whether that drug works before the clinical trial is performed, and maybe design it differently so that you have a better shot at showing that it's effective. And as I think this symposium has demonstrated, another big pro is that there's a huge investment in this area. And I think that the tools we have today are terrific, but they're only going to improve with time. So I think the future is very bright. At the same time, in 2012, I think that there are some uh, difficulties. It doesn't look like it printed out here, but one of the challenges, I think, is the heterogeneity of these cultures. Um, not just the fact that with our best differentiation protocols, we tend to make multiple types of cells and culture, but also that their maturity can vary quite a bit, too. And for many of the assays that we perform, that can complicate the analysis. It's often the case that the cell type we want may actually be the minority of cells in the culture. Some cells are still difficult to, div uh, to make that are relevant for disease. And we still don't know the answer to the key question, will these cells actually predict clinical trial results better than uh, existing models? They sort of have to, uh, <laughs> because the existing models are so bad, but, uh, but I think it still has to be shown. Um, so it is currently a challenging platform to think about for drug screening. Uh, but several years ago, we developed some imaging technology initially to help us in our efforts to make cell-based models of neurodegenerative disease, and it's turned out to be really useful for iPSC modeling. It's a high-throughput longitudinal single-cell uh, analysis system. The work began with a postdoc in my lab, Monsi Arasati, uh, and then subsequent generations of the instrument have been developed, and the latest round, a third-generation uh, microscope, has been made by Mike Ando and Aaron Daub, two talented graduate students. So the system, the current system, has a robotic incubator that delivers barcoded plates to a nest. Uh, we've integrated a robotic arm and programmed it so that it delivers the uh, plates to a microscope stage. <laughs> Excuse me. The microscope has been fully automated, so we have uh, uh, designed it so that it can, um, uh, under computer program control, move a plate into a position to capture a, a picture of a fiduciary mark on the plate, and then using uh, programs to be able to register the position of that plate so that it remembers it for future reference. Uh, 
It then can move the parts it needs to acquire images. The robot can come back and pick the plate up and put it back in the incubator. And it's certainly a high throughput device. Uh, we can do in a few minutes what used to take us about six months. But the most important uh, feature of this system is that uh, once this plate's returned, it can be brought back the next day, week, or month, put back on the microscope, and the microscope can find the same cell that you studied uh, the day before or whenever. Uh, we've been able to follow these cells for six months. And you can see here a movie that was uh, constructed from images that were collected once per day after the plate was removed and returned in a high throughput manner. And you can see how uh, well it's uh, possible to follow individual cells over time. Uh, the way the system works, uh, we've programmed it so that we'll collect uh, individual microscope fields um, under user control, but collect those same fields on subsequent days and then eventually take those images, stitch them together into a montage, organize it temporally, and then we have automated programs that go through and look at those uh, automated strings of images and identify individual neurons or other types of cells, assign it a unique identifying number, uh, and then be able to extract data about that cell and associate it with a number. So in a single image, it'll <coughs> assign numbers, extract data, and the data will get ported to a spreadsheet over time. And then eventually, all the data gets uh, sent uh, externally to an open source statistics program called R, where associations are made. So we call it doing clinical trials in a dish um, because this, the math we use is very similar. It's based on the same math that's done for clinical trials. So the ability to return to the same cell allows us to be able to follow it over its lifetime and to be able to measure what happens in that cell during intermediate stages and then relate it to what its ultimate fate is. And because we can introduce three or four fluorescent uh, reporters at once in a cell, we can follow multiple things and see how they interact dynamically over time to explain fate. So that's really the key capability. Uh, with the math and the ability to follow single cells, we can measure intermediate changes and really tell you not only what, whether they predict a fate, but what fate they predict and how important they are. Uh, and I'll explain in a minute why that's possible. <laughs> One of the things we've learned about this approach is it's about 100 to 1,000 fold more sensitive than conventional uh, high throughput or high content screening that's based on single snapshots in time. Uh, it's also highly quantitative, so as I mentioned, not only do you tell what fate you predict, but you can really calculate the probability. Uh, in other words, uh, how likely that fate is to occur. Because we're able to monitor cells over their entire lifetime, we're also able to capture rare or transient events. And uh, those can sometimes be very helpful for completely changing the way we think about certain biological problems. Uh, it's less important with this approach that we pick a particular time point to capture images because we can capture the whole lifetime. And then the sensitivity, you know, when we originally developed this, we really had hypothesis-driven research in mind, but I think the sensitivity has opened up new possibilities for us uh, for doing unbiased genetic and small molecule screens uh, in these uh, cells. For example, it takes only about eight cells per well, we found, to predict the effect of a small molecule or a gene uh, and what its effect will be. Um, and so that's enabled performance, high throughput screening performance has been uh, quite good. So one of the uh, endpoints that we've been interested in with neurodegenerative disease is uh, survival, since cell death is one of the hallmark features of these diseases. And it's pretty easy to monitor in this system. So if we introduce a fluorescent protein like GFP that's diffusely localized in a cell, what we found is that that uh, fluorescence re uh, remains until the permeability of the plasma membrane is lost and then abruptly disappears. And we know this corresponds to cell death for a number of reasons, but one is shown here. If we add a membrane impermeant dye, Ethidium homodimer, it's absent from the cell until the membrane permeability is lost and then we see the nucleus stain. So we can use that a time point, we can write our automated program so that it finds exactly when the cells died. That gets recorded as one of the pieces of data associated with the lifetime of that cell. And when we do this on thousands or millions of cells uh, from the images, we can then use that information to construct Kaplan-Meier curves. So we can plot, in this case, the survival of a hypothetical experiment where we have an experimental arm surviving less well than the control arm. And then using conventional uh, statistical analysis, uh, survival analysis, we can do a linear transform that calculates the uh, hazard function. Uh, in this case, we've just named it a little more intuitively, risk of death. 
But what it gives you is the moment-by-moment -moment measure uh, of the probability that a cell in that cohort will achieve the endpoint you're interested in, in this case, cell death. And just as the experimental system survived less well in our Kaplan-Meier curve, we see a corresponding increase in the risk of death in the experimental system here compared with control. And because this is an imaging system, it gives us the opportunity to then see an abnormality that we may, may be interested in and relate it to the fate of that cell. So in this case, uh, the abnormality, we look at what happens to the risk of death after it appears, and we don't see a change. It may be an incidental change or finding. But in some cases, we see that the risk of death increases as if it was part of a pathogenic mechanism. And in other cases, we, we've seen uh, the risk of death actually abruptly fall, uh, as if that change that we thought was an abnormality is actually a coping response uh, that cells are producing. So for the first time, it really gives us the, a chance to see what the relationship is between something we see in the microscope and the biological significance of it to the cell. Uh, but not only does it tell us qualitatively what's going on, it gives us quantitative information too, because the amount by which the risk goes up or down gives us a sense of how important it is. Um, and as you can imagine, I've framed this in terms of modeling neurodegeneration, but uh, this idea of trying to figure out what an intermediate change, what significance it has for cell fate is obviously important for a lot of questions in biology, not least of which development uh, would fit. And in addition, um, ultimately, we want to be able to intervene in cell fate and manipulate it to be able to prevent uh, unwanted fates uh, that might occur in disease. So we can, with a therapeutic, do the same thing and measure its effect on cell fate. Uh, in this example, I focus mostly on cell survival as the endpoint, but uh, there's really no limit per se on the endpoint that can be measured. It's up to the user, and we've developed reporters to look at gene expression, uh, a lot of proteasome or proteostasis uh, endpoints like autophagy and proteasome function, bioenergetics and mitochondrial function, aspects that are maybe specific to neuroscience like neurotransmitter receptor cycling or uh, spines, but all these things can be measured uh, uh, in the system in principle. And in the example I've given, I've really focused on sort of one abnormality at a time, but I think one of the attractive features of the math here is that um, we can really build on the information we get with this approach. So with uh, the math that underpins this approach, we can use the observations we make about fate to deduce covariates that we think might predict that fate and then come up with coefficients that help uh, relate uh, the covariates we uh, measure to fate. And you know, the expectation is that looking at a single covariate is unlikely to explain all the fate that we see. But uh, the nice thing about this uh, mathematical equation is that it's expandable. It can be, you can add covariates that both promote fate, retard fate, uh, and that are time dependent. And our expectation is that over time, as we identify more covariates and weight them properly, we're going to get better and better at predicting the uh, fate that we observe, with, hopefully with just a handful of factors. And we're hopeful that that sort of approach can help us um, answer two really important questions. What are the major determinants of fate, and how might we, how might we use these uh, to th target things therapeutically? Um, I want to just uh, move now and tell you uh, briefly about two iPSC-derived models of uh, neurodegenerative disease, focusing first on ALS. Uh, this work's been done by a talented MD-PhD neurologist in the lab, Sammy Barmeda. And if you're not familiar with ALS, it's a fatal and untreatable neurodegenerative disease characterized by loss of upper and lower motor neurons, leading to progressive weakness. Uh, and it's really a devastating disease. 50% of people die within three years of diagnosis. Most of it is sporadic, but about 10% occurs in a familial form. <laughs> and one of the genes that causes familial ALS is a mutation in a gene that encodes the TAR DNA binding protein 43, or TDP43. This protein's involved in regulating transcription and splicing. Uh, and pathology in TDP43 is actually found in a number of diseases, frontotemporal dementia, ALS, and even Alzheimer's disease, even when there isn't a mutation per se in the gene itself. So it is thought to play a more general role in neurodegeneration. But it's also the case that specific mutations in TDP43 can cause ALS. And most of these are clustered in a domain of the protein called the glycine-rich domain. Well, in collaboration with Siddhartha and Chandran, Tom Maniatis, and uh, Chris Shaw, we've made iPS cells from, patients who, uh, from a patient who has ALS harboring a mutation in TDP43. 
and using standard differentiation protocols to make motor neurons involving dual SMAD inhibition and retinoic acid application of pure morphamine, we can make cells that express markers of motor neurons. And we've shown electrophysiologically that these, fe these uh, cells have the features we'd expect, including uh, both spontaneous and evoked action potentials, as well as uh, miniature end plate uh, potentials um, consistent with neurotransmitter expression. The cells also exhibit a couple phenotypes that look like they may be relevant to ALS. One of them is that the mutant protein TDP43 accumulates in these cells, both in a soluble form and in a detergent resistant form. And one of the features of ALS is that TDP43 deposits abnormally uh, in these cells. Uh, it's interesting too because uh, the, there's really no change in the mRNA, so it suggests that there may be a problem with protein homeostasis uh, and maybe protein clearance in these cells. And I'll return to that topic at the end of my talk. We've used the automated microscope to be able to follow these cells over time. And I'm showing you cumulative risk of death curves here, so it's plotted a little differently than the way I showed it to you earlier. The curves are rising over time because we're basically um, measuring cumulatively uh, the cells as they die. But the point here is that the risk of death is higher in motor neurons that we've differentiated from IPS cells from an ALS patient than they are from healthy volunteers. And more recently, in work that's submitted, we've taken those same IPS cells and differentiated them into astrocytes to look at their phenotypes. And that's an interesting question because increasingly, uh, the field of neurodegenerative disease has been focusing on uh, the contribution that other cell types like microglia and astrocytes make to the disease. And what we found is that they too have a survival defect. Um, and they show a number of TDP43 phenotypes that I don't show here, including mislocalization of TDP43 uh, and its accumulation. So it suggests that there may be a cell autonomous effect of TDP43 in astrocytes as well. The other disease I wanted to mention was Huntington's disease. Um, and this work is being carried out by a postdoctoral fellow in my lab, Julia Kay, and an MD PhD student, Amanda Mason, who's in our uh, UCSF uh, cell biology, uh, I'm sorry, developmental and stem cell uh, graduate program. So Huntington's disease is unusual in that it's 100% genetic. Uh, and it has three features. One are these abnormal excessive motor movements uh, that are uncontrolled that you see. Uh, these patients also eventually get a dementia, and they also have very severe emotional problems leading to major depression. And ultimately, 15 years or so after they start having symptoms, they typically succumb to the disease. So the gene that causes Huntington's disease is a bit unusual. Uh, it has a CAG triplet codon near the five prime end of the gene that's expanded a variable number of times. So in this audience, there may be CAG repeats between four and 35. Most people have between 10 and 20. Um, but even a single repeat above 35 puts a person at risk for Huntington's disease. And the longer that expansion is, the earlier they tend to make, uh, develop symptoms. The expansion gets translated into a homomeric polyglutamine stretch. And the field's been very busy the last uh, 10 years, really focusing on why polyglutamine expansions cause neurodegeneration. Um, with NIH support, a consortium of investigators to which I belong uh, aimed to create a model of Huntington's disease that are based on patient-derived IPS cells. Uh, we've collected a number of lines from patients that have different repeats. This one has 33, which is in the normal range. This has 60. This has 180. Uh, but we've collected a number of lines. I think we're up to 40 or 50 now. And in case I forget, uh, these lines are uh, deposited at the Coriol Biorepository and available completely free for anyone's use, um, in case you're interested. Uh, so we've subjected these lines to various differentiation protocols, short ones to make uh, forebrain-type neurons and longer ones that are really geared toward trying to make medium spiny striatal neurons, which is a type of neuron that's most vulnerable uh, in this disorder. And what we found is that even at the neural precursor stage, when we do profiling studies, we can segregate cells that have a normal CAG repeat from those with an expanded repeat. So at really the earliest stage, we can begin to see some differences in these cell types. Uh, despite the differences, the cells do go on to, to make uh, both forebrain and medium spiny neurons, at least based on expression markers, and using a variety of functional assays, looking at potassium, sodium, and calcium currents, as well as responses to neurotransmitters and uh, both evoked and spontaneous action potentials. These cells also exhibit at least eight different uh, potentially disease-relevant phenotypes. 
Um, I'll just mention a couple in the interest of time. One of them is a calcium homeostasis phenotype. So normally calcium influx is a major pathway by which neurons uh, receive signals and transmit them intracellularly to long-term adaptive responses. <clears throat> and so neurons are geared to really be able to uh, take calcium and uh, get back to basal levels very qu uh, quickly um, by buffering it. But what we found was that though our wild-type neurons could withstand multiple stimulations with glutamate, triggering calcium influx, and nevertheless return calcium to baseline, our HD lines showed increasing uh, uh, calcium dyshomeostasis. So with repeated glutamate application, we saw that in the 60 CAG repeat line, gradual accumulation of calcium over time. And with the 180 line, it was even worse, suggesting maybe a, even a CAG dependence to this phenotype. We also see differences in cell adhesion and, and bioenergetics. We've also used the uh, automated microscopy to be able to follow these cells as well uh, by transfecting a fluorescent marker protein in uh, and then being able to follow these cells over time. And like the ALS cells, we find that the neurons we differentiate from HD um, IPS cells survive less well. They have a higher risk of death than those from uh, healthy volunteers. And one of the features of Huntington's disease is that uh, People with Huntington's disease uh, have an abnormal expression of a neurotrophic factor called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which may be relevant for the disease. And then we found that if we remove BDNF from the media, we actually can make the phenotype worse. And if we add superphysiologic BDNF to the media, we can make it better. And this seems to be a feature of the HD lines, but not really a feature of the wild-type lines, suggesting that it may actually be relevant to disease. So I'm just going to finish the last two minutes uh, mentioning an application of this technology to therapeutics development. So we've been trying to develop predictive models of neurodegenerative disease for the last 10 years or so. And this is just a summary model of about 10 years of work where we, one of the most predictive things we found across Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, uh, ALS, and Huntington's uh, by studying our models has been protein dyshomeostasis. And the idea that protein aggregation or malconformations uh, may place stress on refolding and clearance pathways. And I think this suggests the uh, possibility that stimulating these pathways could be a potential therapeutic strategy. And one of the things that we've done recently is to identify small molecules that stimulate a particular pathway in neurons called autophagy. There are a couple flavors of autophagy, but the common feature of these pathways is that they all deliver proteins to the lysosome for degradation. And one reason they've caught the attention of people who work on neurodegenerative diseases is that autophagy seems uniquely suited to be able to clear aggregated protein in contrast to the proteasome. Uh, it's also got connections to senescence and to mitochondrial health, which offer additional reasons why it might be helpful. So we, in collaboration with Leslie Thompson and uh, Malcolm Casali at UCI, have begun to look at the autophagy pathway in uh, human neurons differentiated from IPS cells. And we found that a number of the pathway intermediates seem to be uh, modestly upregulated, potentially as if the cells were trying to cope with uh, these uh, changes and respond. And so we wondered whether stimulating the pathway further might be helpful. So we've uh, conducted screens and identified uh, molecules that can stimulate this pathway. And we found that adding an autophagy inducer can improve the survival of our HD neurons uh, from human neurons from our iPS cells, but has little effect on the wild type lines. And since I mentioned earlier in the talk that there may be a protein homeostasis problem with TDP43 as well, we thought maybe protein homeostasis, because it seems to be a common thread when we uh, have looked at our various models, it might work in our ALS model too. So we've done the same experiment, and we've also found that stimulating autophagy in our human motor neurons from our ALS patients seem to improve their survival uh, as well, but again, have very little survival effect on the healthy volunteer cells. And so we're cautiously hopeful that uh, promising data like this suggests that uh, systems like these can be used to show or to test whether molecules per se can stimulate the process we want in a human neuron from patients and potentially have a beneficial effect, um, suggesting maybe if we can deliver this molecule to the right place for patients, it may make a difference. So let me just uh, summarize. I think neurodegenerative disease is a huge challenge, and clearly more predictive clinical models uh, are necessary. Patient-derived iPS cells potentially may be a physiologically relevant system for studying disease. 
Uh, but they bring their own challenges. I think at the moment, heterogeneity is one of the biggest. Um, longitudinal imaging and single cell analysis, we think, suited to some of the uh, challenges that are posed by PSCs. And we found that at least uh, a couple models, I didn't have time to show you the Parkinson's data here, but that in a couple models of neurodegenerative disease, we see phenotypes that look reminiscent of the human disease and potentially could be the basis for uh, work to study mechanism and potentially even to find therapeutic targets. So I've told you about most of the folks in my lab who helped with this work. I do want to highlight some of our collaborators. The HDIPS consortium, Jim Cazella, Marcy McDonald, Chris Ross, Clive Svensson, and Leslie Thomas Thompson. It's been a terrific group uh, that we've worked together on the HD uh, project. And then the ALS work was done in collaboration with Tom Maniatis, at Arthur and Chandran, and Chris Shaw, another terrific group uh, that's been a lot of help. And I think we've really gotten a lot of help from uh, both uh, foundations, the NIH, and industry partners uh, to do uh, some of this work. And I think it's such a hard problem. We definitely have to work as a team. So I really appreciate all the help we've gotten from every quarter. So thank you very much for your attention. So, um if I understood correctly, you're using fluorescent markers for cell death and calcium. So have you, have you looked at um, morphological features like organelle texture and size and so on and done that sort of machine learning approach to find what you may not be anticipating is going on? Yeah, so that's a great question. <laughs> I think initially our approach was to, um, you know, try to be good cell biologists and look through our images and identify things that we thought might be different or, uh, or differences that have been reported in the literature uh, by studying histologic samples from patients and then write programs to see if we could find the same thing. Uh, but what Natalie's talking about is um, having the machines in sort of an unbiased way look through our images to be able to find differences between uh, patient cells and healthy cells to see if we could uh, come up with additional metrics uh, that might be able to distinguish those two populations. And in addition to being sensitive and maybe uh, discovering new things, I think it's a really attractive way also from the standpoint of screening because uh, we may need our small molecules to correct pretty complex phenotypes, not just single phenotypes. Um, we're just beginning to do that. Um, I'm really excited. We just uh, started a collaboration this week, actually, with Google, who has made a generous gift of um, more computational time than we could ever uh, by ourselves. And that's been one of the main hurdles for us, is that a single uh, microscope generates about a half a terabyte of data a day. And so we have um, tremendous uh, computational challenges. And so up, up till now, we've been kind of limited, and we've tried to use sort of an assays that would fit within our computational um, approaches. But I think now all bets are off. We're going to try uh, to do machine learning, too. Great talk. Thanks, Lawrence. I was just wondering. I mean, so one really attractive feature is that you can follow so many cells and show these kind of Kaplan Meyer like curves. But on the other hand, obviously, the, in most cases, still come from a single patient or a single clone. So I was wondering, like, statistically, how do you integrate that? I mean, you, you, you're going to run the same curves from many clones or from many patients. Or, because again, I think that's probably the biggest problem that we can see from the same clone from the same patient, differential responses and so on. How do you integrate kind of that variability into the additional variability you might have within a given differentiation paradigm? Yeah, I think that um, <coughs> you can. Um, uh, uh, so although we follow single cells, at the stage where we do the integration into Kaplan-Meier curves, we're assembling the population response from different cells within the same culture. But you could use cells from different patients as well to integrate, much the same way you do for a clinical trial, where you're measuring um, responses in individuals, but then integrating that information into some overall assay for phenotype. Um, and I think you're right. Um, we do see, we do certainly see um, differences, for example, depending on the differentiation protocols um, of kind of where the cells get to at different time points, which can have some variation. But I will say we found that um, this uh, probability measure uh, where the measure itself, the cumulative hazard, uh, seems to be uh, normalized to the number of cells that are available, and we found that it's quite a bit less variable than a lot of the other measures that we, um, that we make. Right. Um, 
Uh, have you looked at uh, beta galactosidase? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, IPS. No, we haven't. Uh, so a question related to a modifier for Parkinson's disease. Yeah, no, a good question. Uh, these cells, as anyone who's worked with them, are time consuming, and so it does, we do sort of uh, build one cell line at a time, but I think that's a really in interesting uh, idea, right? Thank you.